Welcome to Ethics Matter. I'm Stephanie Sai, and our guest at the Carnegie Council is a doctor, Elizabeth Economy, an esteemed Asia scholar, an author, and a professor. Liz has written three books on China, including her award winning treatise on China's environment, The River Runs Black. Liz is the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. And it's such a pleasure. I've been following your work for many, many years. And I read recently that you actually wrote your dissertation in the 90s about climate change. It really wasn't on the radar no. at that time. No, it wasn't. Why and, was it on yours? And let me just say it's really great to be here with you, Stephanie. Um, so back in the early 1990s, uh, when I was a graduate student, um, I was actually interested in the role of science uh, in policy making and in the environment. Uh, and climate change was just starting to become a, a big issue because of the Rio conference in 1992. So a lot of countries were beginning to pay attention to climate change. Um, but interestingly, China wasn't really one of them. Uh, and when I went to do my dissertation research there, uh, you know, people hadn't really thought about climate change. Uh, they didn't have a lot of expertise uh, on climate change, except for paleoclimatology, like measuring, you know, ancient climate through tree rings. Um, they didn't know how to estimate carbon emissions at that point. So it was really a very nascent time uh, in China uh, for thinking and working on climate change. Uh, so it was a really great time to, to kind of get my feet wet and, and start to engage with the issue really from the ground up. Well, you foreshadowed, I think, so much. I mean, China today is the largest emitter of carbon dioxide emissions, the greenhouse gas that causes uh, climate change, although on a per capita basis still not matched by the United States. How does climate change today play in to the leadership's larger strategy for China and its economy? Well, there's this been a fundamental transformation, of course, uh, in China's role, both as you suggest, as becoming the world's largest emitter uh, of greenhouse gases, including uh, carbon dioxide, but also uh, in terms of the role that uh, President Xi Jinping wants to play uh, you know, as a climate leader uh, mm -hmm. on the global stage. And uh, as we've seen the United States take a step back, uh, President Trump say that uh, he doesn't want to uh, adhere to the Paris Accords on climate. Uh, President Xi has attempted to step in uh, and uh, raise China's profile on this issue. So I think there's an element of asserting Chinese leadership on the global stage. Climate change is an issue that potentially can help him do that. Uh, and I also think that Xi Jinping sees this as an opportunity for China to capture the global market for clean energy technologies. You know, China has become a leader uh, in the development of solar and wind power. Uh, and so I think he sees this uh, as boosting the Chinese economy as well. For a long time, um, it, there's been this view that climate, uh, addressing climate change must be a trade-off. Um, and the actions that it takes to address emissions is a trade-off um, between economic growth and um, protection of the environment. How does the Chinese leadership see that right now? And I guess the Chinese leadership is really all President Xi at this point because he recently <laughs> completely consolidated power and shrined that in the, in the Constitution. How does she view it? Yeah, so you're right. Xi Jinping has certainly amassed more institutional power than any Chinese leader really since Mao Zedong. Uh, so how he looks at climate change, the actions that he's prepared to take matter a lot. But it's not all that matters. Uh, and you know, a lot of what happens in China with regard to climate change depends on how the country actually implements uh, what Xi Jinping wants to see happen. So I think it's, there are two different things operating. One is Xi's vision uh, for China and climate change. The other is actually what takes place on the ground. And oftentimes, they're quite different. So let's delve into that a little bit more. You mentioned China's commitments in the Paris Climate Accords. It was back in the Obama years when he and President Obama got together, and they both made con commitments. And that later became their pledges in the Climate Accords. How meaningful? Um, was what China pledged. I, I, if I recall, the, the pledge was cap on emissions by 2030 and more and more use of renewables. Is, is that significant? And is, it, um, is that going to make a major dent when it comes to China's impact on the planet? 
I think the significance of China's commitment uh, was really twofold. First, um, that President Xi stood up side by side with President Obama and said, you know, the two largest emitters in the world, the two biggest countries in the world, we're stepping up and we're going to lead on this issue. And that really did help to bring along the rest of the world uh, in terms of forging, uh, you know, a real climate agreement. Um, so I think that was probably the most important uh, thing that happened. Uh, the second was that it gave some energy uh, to China's own uh, climate work. And so it inspired Chinese scientists and Chinese non-governmental organizations, those people who've been long working on the issue, to feel as though, yes, China is going to do something. All of our work is worth something, and we can push forward on this. In terms of China's actual commitment, um, it, it's not insignificant. It's significant that it took a commitment, because uh, until that time, it had refused. Uh, to take a commitment on the grounds that it was still a developing country. Uh, but the actual commitment, uh, pledging to uh, cap emissions uh, and begin to decrease them by 2030 and to ha improve energy intensity uh, by about 60, 65 percent at the same time, that's the amount of uh, energy used per um, unit of GDP, um, is not enormously significant <laughs> uh, for two reasons. First. Uh, it's kind of what China could do just by improving energy efficiency along the path. So sort um, of low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit. Um, and it doesn't actually get uh, the world uh, to that point that, you know, all the climate scientists agree is necessary, you know, not having the Earth warm more than between 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. So ch what China has pledged to do doesn't make a meaningful contribution to achieving that target. And in that context, what we really want now is for China to take on additional commitments. China has to balance, again, that commitment to renewables, that commitment to lowering emissions with its economic growth. When you look at China's growth today, um, do you think that it will, even the, maybe the modest commitments you would call that, that it has committed in Paris, do you see it fulfilling those if growth starts to slow down in a meaningful way? I don't think there's any doubt that China is going to meet its commitments, um, and it's going to meet them probably 10 years early. So that's the, the great news, which is why I think they probably could <laughs> step up and do a little bit more. I think uh, it's important to recognize that the Xi government does understand uh, that you can grow the economy and grow it sustainably, right? That you can integrate environmental protection and uh, economic growth uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, you know, whether or not they actually manage to do that at all times, I think probably that's not the case. So we see that when growth does start to slow, we see, you know, a new push on uh, investment, construction, all, all those kinds of things that tend to lead to uh, greater uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but I think the overall trajectory, the overall effort uh, of the Xi administration uh, is to do a better job uh, in terms of uh, accounting for the environment as it develops. That's so interesting um, that you're saying that you really do believe that President Xi believes that you can grow the economy sustainably. Because in this country, in the United States, um, it, it, the political conversation is very much still you have to choose between environmental protection and economic growth. In that way, is China really um, going to be a leader? Well, I think that hasn't been the case. I think that's the case now with this particular administration in the United States. And I think if you look at many states, if you look at US businesses, uh, you still see a lot of corporate leaders and a lot of state leaders stepping up and saying, you know, we are not going back. Uh, you know, we are not going to go back to the fossil fuel-led economy. We are pushing forward with wind power and solar power and electric cars and taking all those actions that we know are going to propel the United States to become, you know, the economy of the future. Uh, so I think it's true that the Trump administration has taken a significant step backwards, uh, but it's not true that the United States as a whole is following the administration, uh, you know, along that path. Mm -hmm. China's um, government's push for renewables, which you mentioned um, earlier, um, has made it so that solar panels are much cheaper for everyone. And, and so renewables are at parity and even more cost effective than fossil fuels in many markets now. Um, has China started to beat the United States when it comes to renewable energy production. When you look at it from the lens of an economic rivalry, is this an area where, where China sees an opportunity? 
Uh, I think there's no doubt that China looks at its production of solar panels, wind turbines, uh, you know, as an opportunity to become a major exporter, uh, you know, in these areas and to, you know, sell its technologies uh, globally, especially into developing countries. Um, so I think there's, there's you know, a, a big competition here in terms of the overall use of renewable energy, um, and if you include natural gas, um, sort of clean burn, cleaner burning fuels, the United States still is far ahead of China. Uh, China also has an issue uh, domestically in that although its installed capacity of wind power and solar power uh, is significant, its curtailment rate, so that's the amount of uh, solar and wind power that aren't actually used, mm. uh, are, they're very high, as high as 40% uh, in some of the major you know, provinces that use uh, these renewable energies. And so there's a big disconnect in China between the numbers that we see, you know, China has this percentage of you know, solar and wind power, and actually what's being used, because okay. it's not connected to the grid, mm. uh, because it's still uh, more economically uh, beneficial for local governments and, and local grid to use, you know, the, the, what's coming from coal. Coal is generally a more reliable source uh, of energy, and so they've got to fix some pretty significant problems to, to take advantage of the good work that they've done in terms of developing solar and wind. Let's talk a little bit about coal. I was living in Beijing in 2007 and 8 in the run up to the Beijing Olympics and because um, you know, these international uh, delegations and athletes were coming to China, they actually turned off um, and shut down a lot of the coal fired plants right around Beijing. And, uh, and still the air was terrible. Um, but since that point, has coal been phased out in many places or is it still heavily um, part of Chinese uh, economic planning, the coal? So coal um, is still a major <laughs> source of energy. About 62% of China's electricity um, comes from coal. Mm -hmm. um, but in the most populated areas, and you, you mentioned Beijing, uh, they're really trying to move to natural gas and move away from coal. Um, but still, sort of the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei area, their use of coal is 30 times higher uh, than the global average. Um, wow. So the, the goal right now is to reduce the overall uh, use of coal within the Chinese economy from 62% to 58% by 2020. Um, and, and that's significant. It's a significant shift. But it's still, it's very slow moving. And China faces another threat from automobiles. Yeah. So in Beijing alone, you know, part of the reason why on many days in Beijing you still have that soupy gray haze where you can't even see across the street, it's because you're getting the you know, emissions from automobiles as well. Uh, and so as the economy develops, they're facing new challenges, new threats uh, to their air quality. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's a great point because when you think about the number of people in China that are still in poverty that are trying to reach the middle class where they might own a car where they might have an air conditioning unit um, in their house I mean how does China grapple with raising people up from poverty which I know President Xi has said he wants to eradicate poverty in China um, and balancing that with the impacts um, that it's having on its own environment. Climate change aside, we can also talk about local pollution right. and what that means for public health. Right. So I think um, one of the things that is probably underappreciated in the Western narrative on China's environment, because we do tend to focus on the coastal provinces, the wealthiest provinces, the places where the Chinese people agitate the most for cleaner air, so they get the most attention, so Beijing, the most money. Shanghai. Right. All, all down the Chinese coast, Guang, Guangzhou, Guangdong, yeah. you know, all of them. We forget about a lot of the rest of the country. And unfortunately, when you look at the rest of the country, uh, you can see still that China is uh, putting in place new coal-fired power plants. Uh, new coal to gas um, or chemical plants. Uh, you know, right now they have plans um, to put in place, and this is mostly in the western uh, part of the country, in interior provinces, um, uh, put in place maybe 22 coal to chemical plants. If they do that, uh, they will produce uh, as much carbon dioxide emission as, as what is produced by Germany. Wow. Um, so, you know, again, on the in one hand, in, in a year. So um, on the one hand, you can see what's the good news, uh, what's taking place in terms of the deployment of renewables and what's taking place in the coastal um, part of the country. On the other hand, when you really begin to look countrywide, uh, you start to get a slightly different picture uh, because still that development imperative uh, 
drives a, a lot of the Chinese government thinking. It's a little bit like Deng Xiaoping, get rich quick, mm -hmm. right? Get rich first, and first some people will get rich, and then the rest of the country will get rich. Right. This is kind of like first, you know, the coastal provinces will get clean, and then the rest of the country will uh, get clean. What about the citizenry of China and these different places? I mean, you talked about maybe there being more of a movement in the coastal cities, um, more maybe more demand from the citizenry to clean up the air. Um, is that a geographical divide in China that you see? I mean, where is the environmental movement and how much pressure is there on the government to do things um, to clean up the air in different parts of China? Right. So one of the interesting things is that the environment has been a leading source of social unrest in China since the 1980s. Mm. Um, and it's only grown in importance a few years back, maybe around 2012, 2013. Uh, Chinese government reported that the environment had become the leading source uh, of social unrest in the country. And traditionally, environmental protest um, took place uh, in the countryside. Right? You'd have a local uh, factory that was you know, spewing noxious uh, gases or was polluting a, a local stream or river. Uh, it was harming farmers' crops. You know, people were getting sick. Uh, so it was a very immediate kind of, this you know, factory is making us sick. It's you know, ruining our economic livelihood, and they would protest. Uh, but a lot of these were fairly small-scale protests, could be 100 or 200 farmers, sometimes you know, up to several thousand. Um, what started about in 2007 is that you started to get the middle class protest. And it really began in Xiamen over the planned siting of a PX chemical factory, which was going to be put too close to the city center. And uh, local university students and professors got wind of it. And they said, this is illegal, right? Not, not, uh, you're not allowed to do this. Uh, and they planned a very peaceful march, but 10,000, 15,000 people marched over the course of a weekend wearing yellow armbands. And that was really the beginning of that middle class uh, awareness and protest um, of things that would happen before, right? So not simply a Chinese uh, reaction to something that was already polluting, right. but, uh, but a knowledge that this is coming it's going to harm us, and we're going to put a stop to it. Uh, and I think that's the big change that we've seen in terms of the role of the Chinese people uh, in affecting environmental protection, is that they, they now know what is coming down the pike, and they stand up and say, you know, this is not acceptable. I think it's a fundamental transformation uh, really in the past decade or so. Does it concern the one-party authoritarian system and the government in China that the environment may be the issue that the Chinese people will not tolerate, that they will protest about, versus something like human rights? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think um, that, in fact, is why the Xi government began to take action. It really wasn't because within the Chinese government there was a version of Al Gore, right? <laughs> yeah. Somebody who, you know, in himself or herself was a true environmentalist. Um, the Xi government uh, began in uh, 2012, 2013 to take action because uh, there was just a mass uh, protest uh, emerging online, you know, via the internet. Uh, and some well known Chinese billionaires and children's authors. Uh, began to try to rally the people online to say, we want you to take action. Uh, and the initial response from the Chinese government, from Li Keqiang, from Xi Jinping, was, well, it took 30 years for us to get to this point, right? It's going to take another 30 years for us to address this problem. And the Chinese people said, no, you know, we want you to take action now. We don't want our children not to be able to go outside. We don't want to be living in an environment where you know, our lungs, it's the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, just breathing the air in Beijing. Uh, we want you to take care of this now. And so I think uh, that was the moment, that was the inflection point uh, when the Chinese government began to take this issue of air pollution seriously. A lot of people have compared China's modernization and its economic development and the fact that it ended up polluting vast parts of its land and water and soil, and I want to get in more into those specific issues in a bit, um, but to the Industrial Revolution in this country or in Europe. 
and said, you know, why shouldn't China be able to do everything that it has to do to exploit its own natural resources in order to grow? Um, you've been researching this issue for, for so many years. Um, what's your response to that explanation? Right. I think you know there are a couple of things. First, um, it's it's not a terribly useful comparison to make, uh, sort of the China to the United States or Europe, for example, because. The environmental degradation and pollution in China has been taking place for centuries. Mm. Uh, so whether from war or uh, over uh, use of land, or even you know back in the uh, 1700s, you could find um, that there were reports of protests uh, mm. around polluted uh, water from a local dyeing factory mm. uh, in China. Um, so China has been suffering from environmental degradation and pollution for centuries. It is not simply a function of the past 30 or 40 years of very rapid uh, economic development. Uh, and in fact, you can go back and look at the memoirs of uh, China's first uh, environmental protection uh, agency head, uh, Chu Geping. And he talks about China during the 1950s and the 1960s, during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, when Beijing had you know, 700 factories inside the city of Beijing, 700 factories spewing you know, uh, toxic gases um, and talks about the polluted water. Uh, so, I, you know, China is, by the time China began uh, its rapid period of industrialization, sort of Deng Xiaoping and, and afterward, um, it was already about a quarter desert or highly uh, desertified, you know, wow. very severe land degradation. It's roughly the same size as the United States. Uh, we've never faced a condition like that. So, you know, from the beginning, I don't think it's a terribly useful comparison to make. The other reason it's not that useful is because we know so much more now mm -hmm. about the impact of the environment, right, on the economy, on people's health, uh, than we did back in the 1800s mm -hmm. uh, or early 1900s when Europe and the United States were going through the Industrial Revolution. Um, and we should be able to do better. And we have the technologies to do better. And we have the policy instruments to do better. So saying that uh, China should just develop and watch its people suffer and watch 1.6 million people die prematurely every year because of air pollution related diseases, uh, you know, to me seems criminal. You wrote um, The River Runs Black in 2004, which is read by everyone that's interested in what's happening in the environment in China about the environmental degradation there. You went into the history as well. Um, was your book a warning to China? And do you think it was heated? Because I imagine the officials in China have read The River Runs Black. Well, it, at the time it came out, I will say, I did hear that um, at least parts of it were translated uh, for the Chinese leadership, and they were very unhappy. Uh, with the book. Um, I think they were probably unhappy because um, it pieced together uh, a lot of what they already knew, of course. It's not like they were ignorant of what was happening in their own country, um, but it made it a kind of complete whole and story. And I think they were unhappy because it also talked about the environment as a potential source of social unrest and even of political change down the line because the environment has served that capacity in other countries in Eastern Europe. And so I think both from a, you know, here, here's what's happening, you know, writ large in China with regard to the environment and, you know, here's how the environment could lead to the downfall of the Communist Party, I think they probably weren't too happy about the book. Fast forward to today, um, how would you change the thesis of that book, if at all? How would you revise it? Well, I think in terms of the way that China, the Chinese leadership approaches uh, the environment, uh, sort of the policy mechanisms that they utilize, a lot has not changed. Um, in still, it's an authoritarian state, so a lot happens from the top down. Many of the policies that are touted as new uh, are old. <laughs> For example, you know, they say, well, now we're going to evaluate uh, our local officials based on how well they protect the environment, mm -hmm. not really just on how well they grow the local economy. Well, that was something they were doing in the mid-1990s. Mm. Um, so a lot of what is being, you know, billed as, hey, this is really innovative, and look at the new seriousness with which we're addressing this challenge, they're really drawing on very traditional uh, means of, of uh, tackling the problem. On the other hand, I do believe this is the first time uh, that the Chinese leadership fully recognizes 
the import of the environment uh, and is seriously attempting to tackle the problem. I don't think any Chinese leadership until this one uh, has said, we really need to change the way we do business. When you compare the systems of government in the United States versus China, um, which do you think ultimately has a better ability to address things like climate change? Well, the way that I think about this is actually that um, the United States has a much more difficult time uh, coming to the right conclusion uh, at the very top. But once we've uh, come to that conclusion, uh, then we do a much better job of actually implementing laws. Um, and so, whereas China, you know, Xi Jinping, uh, as I suggested, can say, you know, we need to do X or Y or Z, oftentimes that directive gets you know, mutated <laughs> all the way down uh, the chain because in many instances, it's, it's simply that. It's a directive um, or it's a campaign, right? Like let's uh, have a tree planting day mm -hmm. and we're gonna plant you know, five million trees across this country uh, to help green the country, uh, to help stem desertification. But then the problem is that nobody waters those trees that actually they plant the trees too close together and they die, that they don't pay attention to what kind of tree they're planting. And so there's a disconnect between, you know, what is mandated from the top and what happens at the bottom. So there's a lot of inefficiency that's built into a top-down system. Our inefficiency tends to come in the decision-making process at the very top. Elizabeth Economy, thank you so much for your expertise and your insights on China and climate change. Thank you, Stephanie. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.